My name is Seth Davis. I'm an assistant professor in forest entomology in the Forest and Rangeland Stewardship Department. I got interested in forest entomology sort of accidentally. I initially started college as a philosophy major and I did take this deviant logic class where the professor proved using deviant logic that if he was wearing a red shirt it must therefore be Tuesday. And I think I decided then that this wasn't for me and that I should do something more practical. But I really loved being outdoors and I wanted to do something that I felt like was important for nature um, and so wound up at, at natural resources science from that. The question that I'm trying to address with my research isn't related so much to bark beetles themselves. Uh, it's more related to understanding symbiotic interactions between organisms and how that affects ecosystems. So the bark beetles are a great study system for that because of all the symbiotic interactions that they're involved with. Interactions at the organismal scale and things that affect those interactions ultimately scale up to influence ecosystem level process. I do really like working with uh, graduate students. So watching students grow and learn over a period of one to several years and improve their skills and watching them sort of get it, you know, after a while I think is really, re re really rewarding for me. Dr. Seth Davis. He is a forest entomologist and assistant professor here in the department. He received his PhD from Northern Arizona University in Flagstaff and after that worked for a little while in Washington for the Agricultural Research Service and was a professor at Cal Poly in San Francisco before coming here to CSU. Um, his research focuses on the microbial behavioral and chemical ecology of insects in agricultural rangeland and forested ecosystems, which is what his talk today is going to be about. Um, today his talk is titled Advances in Biology, Ecology um, of the Spruce Beetle in Colorado. And with that, please join me in welcoming Dr. Seth Davis. Well, thanks, Andrew, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm excited to share what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So for those of you who remember my job interview a few years ago, I said if I was hired, I would study the spruce beetle, and I have. So <laughs> we're going to talk about that uh, quite a bit. Um, now, the broad overview of the work that we do in the lab can basically be summed up with this diagram. And this is something that I'll revisit several times throughout the talk uh, to sort of fill it in and, and give you an idea of, of the kinds of things we're working on. So generally we focus on species level, intera species level interactions and use interactions between species to understand patterns and processes at landscape scales. So one of the primary things that we focus on is the, the spruce beetle. This is my area of research. Uh, interactions between the beetle and some of the microbial organisms that are important to the success of the beetle, and then interactions between beetles and trees. Their principal host tree in Colorado is Engelmann spruce, so we'll revisit some of the ecology of Engelmann spruce, and then interactions between uh, microbes and the host trees. Oh, uh, another thing before we get going, so I mentioned that we, we work a little bit across scales, and today what I want to focus on are, are really three different scales of interaction. So I'll be re discussing specifically some organismal biology of the beetle and its interactions with microbial symbionts, uh, landscape scale variability in host tree defenses within the state of Colorado, and their interactions with the microbial community associated with the beetle, and then some of the larger scale climatic drivers that impact these this triumvirate of interactions that I'm showing you here. Uh, one thing I should point out also is that we already have a pretty good idea of what interactions between beetles and trees look like. Uh, generally when bark beetles kill trees, this is bad for trees and good for beetles. So I've denoted that here with a red and green arrow. Okay, so I think that's fairly self-evident. We're not going to focus too much on the beetle-tree interactions. 
So first let's just discuss uh, what exactly a spruce beetle is. This is a tree killing insect, five to six millimeters in size, so they're not very large. Uh, they can range in their coloration quite a bit. The name Dendroctinus literally translates to tree killer. So what this means is that as part of their life cycle, they are compelled to attack and overcome living host trees. And we'll discuss the reason for that in a little bit. Part of that has to do with their interactions with microbial symbionts. Uh, the life cycle of the insect can range from anywhere from one to three years depending on the population and the um, environmental conditions. So in colder environments, they actually tend to take longer to develop, and this can have significant impacts on the ecology as well. Uh, this is a map of spruce beetle disturbance in the state of Colorado over the last 15 years or so. So what you're looking at here is the range of Engelmann spruce in the state. That's shown in green, kind of light green. And then the red is showing you actually aerial survey data. These are polygons. So you can see there's a whole lot of them because they look like they're all together. Aerial survey data that show you areas of significant tree mortality. So you can get an idea from looking at this figure or this map that quite a bit of the spruce forest throughout the state of Colorado has been really significantly affected by spruce beetle. Um, I would estimate, based on some of my analyses, that at least five million trees have been killed in the last 10 years or so. And obviously these kind of disturbances have pretty significant effects on the structure, function, and composition of high elevation spruce forests. So this is something what that looks like. Uh, this is the Rio Grande National Forest circa 2015. So you get the idea that after a significant spruce beetle outbreak, there's not a lot of living tree material remaining. But I would argue that in order to understand these landscape level disturbances, these landscape level processes, we first have to know about some of the basic biology that drives spruce beetle success within host trees. And in order to do that, we first have to just sort of have a good idea of what a spruce beetle is, right? So what's a bark beetle really doing? And this little cartoon here is designed to sort of show you um, what's really going on. So really, spruce beetles are fungus farmers, as are many of the dendroctinous beetles. Now it's, it's a common misconception that they're strictly phloem feeders. So a lot of these dendroctinous beetles, the most aggressive species that kill trees, are actually fungus feeding insects. So they carry around a specific community of fungal symbionts that they introduce into their host trees upon attack. These fungi grow and prol proliferate throughout the tree and then the developing beetle larvae actually feed on tree phloem and phloem that's colonized by fungal tissues. And this is very important for their nutrition because as I'll show shortly, uh, tree phloem itself is not really a very nutritious substrate at all. And it's actually thought that this association with these specialized fungi is one of the drivers of the tree killing behavior. So the fungi that they carry around are not really found anywhere else, usually purely within these specialized fungal transport structures that the beetles have called mycangia. So a mycangia hasn't really been identified in the spruce beetle yet, but we're working on that and I'll show you some evidence that would suggest there is indeed a mycangia. Um, point being that really they rely on this ancient form of agriculture, this interaction with fungi for their well-being. So things that affect these fungi have dramatic impacts on the success of beetles. Now this diagram just basically generalizes the life cycle of the spruce beetle uh, and it's very similar for the mountain pine beetle as well. Typically beetles attack uh, hosts in the spring. Emerging pioneer beetles will choose a host for whatever reason. They lay eggs in it and as they uh, oviposit and those, those larvae begin to actually develop and feed, this is concomitant with the growth of staining fungi throughout the tree material, uh, throughout the tree bowl. So these fungi will grow th all throughout the galleries and this usually is matched with the timing of larval development. 
So the fungus that's associated with the spruce beetle is actually a blue staining fun fungus. So it's sometimes just called blue stain. I'll refer to it as fungus, fungal symbiont, blue stain fungus, or possibly leptographia because that's actually the genus of the fungus. So this is one of the real interests of the research program is to understand not only variability in these fungi, but to understand factors driving the success of the fungus and how that relates to the success of the insect itself. One of the classic uh, paradigms in forest entomology has been that these fungi actually help beetles to overcome hosts by killing trees. Now this is not always true. It's sometimes it's true, sometimes it's not. It's not known in this instance and for this particular species complex whether or not this species of fungus, Leptographium, plays a role in helping to overcome tree defenses or not. Um, so that's another thing that we're working on and we'll, I'll discuss a little bit as well. So as I mentioned, most Androctonus species are actually associated with one or several species of fungi. And this is a tightly linked co-evolutionary relationship. In fact, like I said, lots of beetles have developed specialized structures that secrete particular enzymes that actually proliferate the growth of some of these fun fungi within the beetle body. And then when they're laying their eggs in, their in trees and host trees, they are depositing these fungi all over the place. So there were several anecdotal reports in the literature that spruce beetle had what's called a pit mycangia. Now typically a mycangium is a structure on the thorax or in the mouth parts that ooze fungal spores when beetles are chewing uh, on their hosts. But it was thought that on the spruce beetle, this structure was somewhere on the thorax or on the wing casing. And I, I'll show you a little bit more just now. Um, okay, so let me orient you here. We're going to walk through some, some scanning electron micrographs. So if you're looking at this image of the beetle, see all these little in, indentations up and down the wing casing? You might not be able to see them very well. They may just look like little dots from where you are, but these are called striae. And these are actually tiny impressions in the elytra. And it's thought that this is where the fungi are carried on this particular species. So looking at about 15x magnification, uh, the striae look kind of washed out. I don't know if this is, I guess we're already dark up here. Uh, but it's about the same magnification as this image. Now if we zoom in a little more, to around 220x. This arrow is, by the way, pointing to the exact same spot. You can just barely begin to see, first of all, that these insects are really, really hairy. Uh, they're totally covered in hair. But you can just begin to see where some of these striae are actually filled with fungal spores. And it's a little difficult to see in this image, but this is pointing to this same spot on the beetle elytra right here. And this is at a magnification of about 2,500x. The scale bar here is 10 micrometers. Okay, so you're looking at something that's roughly a hundredth of a millimeter in diameter. So this is really, really small. But this little follicle here is actually loaded up with fungal spores. So you can see these spores right here. We'll take an even closer look. So here's a really, really, really close up picture. The scale bar here is about one micrometer. So that's, what, a, th a thousandth of a millimeter? So this is like smaller than you can, closer than you can put your fingers together. It's as small as you can get. Uh, and here are those same fungal spores loaded up in that, that strial structure. So it looks like this is probably indeed where these fungi are carried on the body of the beetle. Uh, here's another picture zoomed out a little bit, a picture of another striate about the 10 micrometer scale. And again, you can just see that these punctures are loaded up with microbial life. Here's again the same spore type we were just looking at. It can be a little difficult to see from this distance, but more or less these things are totally covered with microbial life. And luckily for me, it turns out that that set of organisms that's present on the exoskeleton of the beetle is fairly consistent. There's only one or two fungal species and maybe three or four yeast species. By the way, if you are to take these insects and culture them on a growth medium, what you find is that pretty much every single individual 
is associated with the same species of fungus. So I think we can probably reasonably conclude that like the other dendroctinous species, this is likely uh, a symbiotic interaction. So we worked some with Jane Stewart's lab um, to actually begin to identify these fungi. So we wanted to make sure that yes, we were indeed we were continuing to isolate the same fungus over and over again, at least by all appearances. But you know, in order to be a good microbial ecologist, we actually have to make sure that we know what these species are. So Jane's lab did some sequencing of a number of strains that we isolated throughout Colorado and looked at genotypes uh, of several genes. And more or less, the story is that we found that this fungus is consistent with the fungal species Leptographium abiotinum. It's also found on uh, several other species of bark beetles, and in some cases can be pathogenic to certain host trees. Like I said, unknown whether or not this is pathogenic to uh, Engelmann spruce. But just knowing it's there doesn't really tell us anything, right? So one of the next steps that I wanted to take was to begin to understand some of the functional roles of these fungi within this complex. So this uh, interaction diagram here was actually taken from a recent grant proposal. But let me unpack this briefly for you. More or less, we're interested in the effects of these fungal symbionts, the Leptographium species and yeast species, on, on several different functional roles in this system. Uh, primarily, we think that fungi might be food, right? This was this sort of the prevailing hypothesis. I mentioned this right at the beginning. There's also the hypothesis that fungi may defend beetles from pathogens. So there are certain fungal pathogens that are also ubiquitous in this system, in this, um, in this microbial community that can be very harmful to the insects. So we thought perhaps the fungal symbionts they're associated with play a role in defending them from pathogens. And the final role that perhaps these fungi indeed detoxify tree defenses. So maybe they make the environment better for spruce beetle. And these are the kind of questions that we're asking. So the analysis, or this analysis, was actually just recently done. Uh, we, we were invited to submit a paper to a special issue of the journal Fungal Ecology on bark beetle fungus interactions. So this is something that's all happened pretty much within the last like three months to get this out. So we did this at a pretty breakneck pace. Uh, this first hypothesis, the concept that these fungi might be food, we addressed by actually packing up a bunch of fungi and sending them off to a food company that performed nutritional analysis for us. And they also analyzed spruce phloem. So we were able to compare the nutritional content of the fungus to the nutritional content of spruce phloem as well as several other species of fungi which are edible. Uh, these are truffles, this Trephysia species, that's like a, a gourmet truffles, and edible mushrooms, typical stuff that you'd find in the grocery store. So at first glance, this isn't, it, it doesn't pop out at you that like, wow, they're super nutritious, but when you compare it to spruce phloem, that's when you can really see the difference. Right? So if we just compare the protein content, for example, in spruce phloem versus in these fungi, they have, these fungi have about 90% more protein than spruce phloem does. Uh, they're also a significant source of nitrogen. Nitrogen is one of the most limiting factors in insect development. But spruce phloem has no nitrogen. So even something is better than nothing. Uh, where this really jumps out at me is, is in terms of the phosphorus content. So again, phosphorus is another one of those elements or minerals in nature that can be pretty limiting for plant growth or insect development. Well, the phosphorus content of this fungus blows away that of spruce phloem. It's about 180 times greater. And in addition, it's way higher than other edible species of fungi. So this particular fungus appears to be really unusually high in phosphorus content. Lastly, it's a reasonable source of fatty acids, uh, namely decanoic acid and palmitic acid. So these are substances that you do not find in conifer phloem, but are important for animal development. So I think just based on 
you know, that simple analysis and simple comparison, it's fairly evident that the nutritional content of the fungus pretty well exceeds that of the nutritional content of phloem alone. Uh, a second hypothesis was that fungi defend beetles from pathogens. So let me unpack this a little bit for you. Now what you're looking at here is what's called mycosis. So this is a group of grasshoppers that have been killed with a fungus called Bovaria bassiana. Now Bovaria is a ubiquitous enemopathogen that's found in virtually all forest ecosystems. Uh, this is something that Andrew Mann is working on in the lab to try to develop uh, more effective biological controls for this insect. Now it's found that somewhere around 28,000 colony forming units of this fungus exist on like every square centimeter of bark. Okay, so it's, it's everywhere. Um, and this is something that beetles have to constantly contend with. They're constantly being challenged by these enemo pathogens as they're trying to bore around and find a place to live. So we have been doing a number of laboratory tests to evaluate exactly how pathogenic these fungi are. The short answer is they're really pretty darn pathogenic. So uh, this is a survival curve comparing beetle survival over time in insects that have been treated with the entomopathogen uh, in black and insects that have been not treated or treated with water. So we're able to demonstrate that indeed there is a much more rapid rate of mortality when the fungus is present. Now one of the things we were interested in, ergo, is how do they compete with these pathogenic fungi, right? Uh, now, Bovaria itself, in terms of fungal competition, is actually pretty nasty. So it does a really good job of out-competing everything, growing really fast, and infecting insects as fast as it can. By the way, have you guys ever seen that, uh, like, Planet Earth video where the ant crawls up to the top and then a mushroom, like, grows out of its head? So this species, or this fungus, is, I believe, the anamorph of that same fungus. Is that right? The anamorph, yeah. So it's closely related to some of the uh, gee whiz, you know, enemopathogenic fungi from tropical rainforests. Kind of a neat aside. But when we looked at the ability of Leptographium, the beetle symbiont, to compete with this enemopathogenic fungus, we found that in general it does a pretty good job of out-competing it. So in this dish here, basically, by the way, this, these tests are pretty simple. You just take one species and put it on one side of a petri dish, put the other on the other side, and look to see who grows over who. And uh, in this instance, the blue stain fungus, Leptographium abiotinum, wins, so to speak. And on average, it tends to outcompete the uh, Bovaria fungus about 60% of the time or more. Uh, more importantly, the Bovaria fungus is not able to actually grow over it. So it does only really need to hold down a small amount of space in order to keep the gallery and the developmental en environment enemy free for the bark beetle. Uh, the third hypothesis we looked at was whether or not fungi detoxify tree defenses. And here's just a, a little histological cross section of some conifer phloem. You'll note one of the primary uh, features in this are these large resin ducts, right? So when you puncture the vascular tissue of a conifer tree, it responds by spitting out tons of sap and resin to try to occlude that hole and kill whoever is attacking it. So it turns out that spruce trees have a couple of compounds that are really, really common and also really, really toxic to most insects. One chemical that we found that's in literally every single spruce tree that we surveyed is this compound 3-carine, so this is a monoterpene. And we compared media amended with 3-carine um, that was also inoculated with this fungus. We found that over time, media amended with the symbiotic fungus had significantly lower concentrations of this tree defensive chemical, suggesting that indeed in a time frame that is uh, well correlated with beetle egg laying and development, we see a significant reduction in tree defensive chemistry, uh, probably due to the fungus over that same time frame. So if we look back at this interaction figure and try to fill it in based on what we saw, well I think we could assume that 
The fungus is fairly nutritious compared to tree phloem. Uh, it does a good job of outcompeting with uh, outcompeting a ubiquitous pathogen. It does a good job of degrading some of the chemicals that are present in spruce phloem. So I'm going to conclude that probably this is a mutualistic relationship. We can probably guess that this is benefiting the insect. There are a couple of smoking gun experiments that we're waiting to perform this summer to formally demonstrate that association with the fungus increases beetle reproductive rate. And this is something I'll be working on uh, with uh, Javier Mercado from the RMRS. So we have a plan to, to try to go after the final steps of this work this summer. Um, so, you know, welcome to the jungle. This is the, the very sort of edge of what we know about the microbial ecology of this insect at this point, and we're well behind what's been demonstrated from several other systems. So we've concluded that, okay, this is probably a mutualism. They probably are benefiting one another. But I think the next step is to then begin asking the question, how do those symbiotic fungi interact with tree defenses across broader spatial scales? And so I'll share with you some of the work that we did last summer, um, which I think you'll find pretty interesting. So as I mentioned, if you perforate the vascular tissue of a conifer tree, what it does is, is it tries to spit you back out by producing lots and lots of resin, right? So conifers are also um, endowed with constitutive and inducible defenses, meaning that they're loaded up with these chemicals called terpenoids or monoterpenes. And this is generally pretty toxic stuff, right? Uh, and in some instances, or for some species, they can really ramp up the concentrations of these monoterpenes depending on the types of pathogens or pests that they're exposed to. These compounds are pretty highly inheritable, so there's a lot of genetic variation for them, and they may or may not impact the success or failure of spruce beetle. We have really no idea up, up until now. Um, if all goes well for the tree, this is something like what the situation would look like. The beetle gets encased uh, by the resin and crystallized, is unable to successfully complete egg laying, and these terpenoid compounds are also fairly antibiotic, so they can kill fungi or pathogens or anything that's introduced into the tree vascular tissue at that point. Um, so to get at the idea of landscape scale variation in tree defensive chemistry, last summer, along with the field tech, I basically drove around to quite a few of the high elevation passes where Engelmann spruce was present in Colorado, collected phloem samples, and then analyzed them using my uh, fancy gas chromatograph. I think somebody asked me a couple of months ago, like, what are you going to do with that thing anyway? And, well, this is what I did with it. So. Uh, I said I was going to analyze everything, and they didn't think that was funny. So, What we found is that there's about 10 monoterpenoids that are present in spruce in the state of Colorado. Some of these are present in every single tree. So these three right here, alpha pinene, beta pinene, delta carine, or three carine, these compounds are present in every single tree in differing amounts. The rest of these are present in most trees, but some only have a few, or some have very low concentrations of these secondary compounds. Point being, we can look at the concentrations of all of these compounds in individual trees and use that as a basis for classifying trees into phenotypes, right? So I applied a classification scheme to the variability in these compounds, and what we found was that there's basically two chemical types. There's basically two types of spruce in Colorado. One is predominated by delta carine, or 3 carine. The other is predominated by alpha and beta pinene. So these grouped out quite clearly. Uh, if we were to overlay a bootstrap probability onto this, these would be statistically significant clusters, so they're, they're different. And then this gives us a basis for then going back into these populations and looking at the frequency of these phenotypes and assessing how the frequency of these phenotypes may or may not impact observations of tree mortality on the landscape. <coughs> 
<coughs> so this is how that breaks out. Um, most populations have both phenotypes present, but some appear to be predominated by one or the other. So that by itself I think is interesting, but one of the things that we were able to do was actually overlay the aerial survey data in a buffer around these sample locations to ask the question, how does phenotypic frequency at a site impact observations of tree mortality, right? around, um, I think we did like 10 kilometer buffers. So within a 10 kilometer area or radius around these sample locations. And I think this is exciting because what we found was as the proportion of the alpha pinene chemotype increases within a site, so does the probability of tree mortality from spruce beetle. So essentially we found that when one type predominated, mortality was much higher than when both types were present. So that's pretty sweet. Well, why is that happening? Well, one hypothesis could be that it's due to its interactions, the interactions of these phenotypes with these symbiotic fungi that may or may not be driving these patterns on the landscape. So this is a complex figure. Don't try to read it all at once. I'll unpack it for you. Uh, but basically what you're looking at here is the performance of about 20 isolates of the symbiotic fungus, 20 genetically distinct isolates of the symbiotic fungus in response to every single one of these tree compounds, as well as blends of compounds representing the two chemical types. And there's a couple of things that, sh that are important take home points from this. The first is that we tested all of these things at different concentrations. So the black bars show you 1% concentration, the gray bars show 5% concentration, and the white bars show 10% concentrations of monoterpenoids in growth media, okay? And the cool thing is, is that at low monoterpene concentrations, these terpenoids actually enhance the growth of the fungus. They like it, right? They can eat it up. So. This is similar to what we demonstrated in that earlier figure where I showed you that they can degrade a particular one of these defensive compounds over time. So it's interesting to me that low monoterpene concentrations in host trees are actually probably bad for the tree because that means the fungus can eat your defenses essentially, right? Uh, but as monoterpene concentrations increased, this was uniformly detrimental to fungal growth. But one thing that I thought was really cool about this test was that when we looked at the effect of the blends versus the effects of individual compounds, the blends were always inhibitory, even at low concentrations. So that suggests there's some emergent property of the phenotype which does better than having any one compound alone. Something even cooler, notice this uh, compound right here. Linalool, it's actually a monoterpene alcohol. Well, this compound completely suppresses fungal growth at all concentrations. So we might expect spruce trees that have a high concentration or any concentration of linalool whatsoever to be resistant to colonization by the beetle fungus complex. Um, so that's pretty neat. So let's talk about how those monoterpene concentrations actually brought, break out at the population scale. Well, if we were to just take all of the trees that we looked at and look at their total concentration of monoterpenes, it looks like about 5% of spruce trees on the landscape, so that's this line and over, have monoterpene concentrations that are consistent with resistance to the fungus. That is, they've got enough, high enough concentrations that they're just going to be innately resistant. Around a third of a percent have enough linalool, that monoterpene alcohol that completely suppressed fungal growth, to be probably also resistant to colonization. So unfortunately, around 70% of the trees had monoterpene concentrations that were actually consistent with enhancement of fungal growth. So a lot of trees on the landscape are going to be really good hosts for this beetle fungal complex. Around 5% are probably resistant, and less than 1% are probably like bulletproof, right? 
so uh, we can make it if we try, I guess. Um, so there's two spruce chemotypes. And I've drawn the arrow here is, as black, right? Uh, and the reason for that is that the interaction wasn't obviously negative or positive. In some instances, trees benefited fungal growth. In other cases, they inhibited fungal growth. So this interaction is variable, right? And it depends a lot on the individual level phenotype or the phenotype frequency at a site. So that's all well and good. You know, we've talked uh, about beetle fungus interactions and tree fungus interactions. But I think another thing that's important to note is that essentially um, all of these interactions uh, I was off by one animation. Essentially, all of these interactions are couched within the context of, of climate, right? So we looked at something maybe at the scale of the state of Colorado, but I think with ongoing environmental variation, uh, it's a serious concern how this complex and observations of tree mortality will respond to differing climatic conditions. So the question really is, are there state factors that control observations of tree mortality from the beetle fungus complex? Well, we don't really know the answer to this specifically. Um, there's a lot of papers out there, however, that have made a lot of hay out of this. So a lot of people have analyzed the effects of climate on outbreak. So if you're going to take a quick look at this, uh, set of papers I laid out here. Aside from spruce beetle, what's, this, what's the word that appears in every single title? Anybody? Outbreak. Outbreak. Outbreak appears in every single title, right? So people have made a lot of hay out of analyzing the effects of climate on outbreaks. But one thing that I find bothersome about this is that Nobody defines what an outbreak is. In fact, outbreaks are traditionally treated as a bunch of trees died. A whole lot of trees died, so it must be an outbreak, right? But an outbreak, in my perspective, is a symptom. It's not the actual proximal cause of the outbreak itself, right? The reason that an outbreak occurs is because the population density of beetles get very, very high. So I think it's important to create a standardizable definition of what an outbreak is for the purposes of broad comparisons across studies and for the purposes of comparing climatic effects uh, in the presence and absence of true outbreak populations. Okay. So in classic population dynamics theory, an outbreak is actually uh, a mechanism that occurs once the population passes a certain density threshold. Now most of you are probably familiar with basic population growth um, and density dependence, right? Does everyone know what density dependence is? More or less, right? So bark beetles typically exhibit negative density dependence. That is, as the population gets very dense and closer and closer to carrying capacity, growth rate goes down and down and down until you hit carrying capacity and growth rate is either zero or negative. So typically this negative density dependence keeps the population cycling around some low density equilibrium. It can't have an outbreak because of density dependence, but environmental conditions may cause a decoupling of that cycle in which the population can break free of density dependent thresholds and begin cycling around some high density threshold. This is an outbreak. Okay, so an outbreak isn't just, hey, a bunch of trees got killed. An outbreak is actually specified by the behavior of the population itself. So I wanted to try to define what is an outbreak. And this was one of the first things that I started on when I got here. Um, and I'm still wrestling with. So this seemed like a simple question. It turned out to be a really complex question. So one of the things that I did right away like a month after starting the job was basically download all the aerial survey data from every single national forest in the western United States 
uh, that has records of spruce beetle disturbance. So I show here only 26 because I basically only included forests that had greater than 75% of the period of record. So at least 15 out of the last 20 years had to have some record of tree mortality from aerial survey. All told, this is around 40,000 observations of spruce beetle mortality, 40,000 records of mortality. So I think, you know, at small spatial scales, there are challenges with using the aerial survey data for the reason that uh, they're not necessarily as spatially explicit as we would like them to be. And it's challenging for observers to estimate just how many trees in an area were killed. But I think at these very, very broad scales, this is the correct application of these types of data sets because it allows us to compare patterns across entire national forests. A lot of other people have also taken the approach of gridding these data sets into cells. But I opted away from that because I argued, at least to myself, that the National Forest Unit is what is representative of a funding and planning unit, right? So this is where the work is being done, not on grid cells. So I basically was able to use these aerial survey data from all the forests in the western U.S. I excluded Alaska um, to create forest level time series of spruce beetle mortality. And from these time series, I was able to generate a bunch of population parameters that could be used to, again, apply a classification scheme to determine what's an outbreak and what's not. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. These are basically the final result of some of that analysis. These are called phase plots. So what you're looking at here is population density on the x-axis, on the y's, population growth rate. It exists between negative one and one, right? A near extinction or a total doubling of the population within a given year. And this is neat because what this allows us to do is actually visualize some of those oscillations around stable thresholds. So in this example, this is the Idaho Panhandle Forest right here, uh, National Forest. There is no real there's oscillation around one equilibrium, a low density equilibrium. This is the San Juan National Forest. We were able to visualize oscillation around a low density equilibrium and a high density equilibrium. So that shows us this is an outbreak and you can actually see it. So I was able to take from that this whole range of population parameters. The difference between these upper and lower threshold boundaries, the slope of the density dependent function, the explanatory power of density dependence, the rate of change in the tree mortality signal, mean growth rate of the population, uh, the bimodality of the time series, blah, 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 blah. Point being, we were able to take all of these population level parameters and apply a classification scheme to that to see which forests are really having outbreaks and which are not. So if we were to map that out in comparison with a, our classification dendrogram, it looks something like this. Basically, you have populations uh, that are red. These experience some of the biggest outbreaks. And this appears to be clustered mainly around the Intermountain West and the Rocky Mountains, the Southern Rockies, right? And then you have the green group, which really doesn't experience, or hasn't, I sh shouldn't say doesn't, hasn't experienced an outbreak in the last 20 years. And then this blue group, which is, they're having outbreaks, but they're not as severe. So this is important because it shows us a couple of things. First, yes, we can distinguish between outbreak and non-outbreak, but also there's two kinds of outbreaks. There's not just one, there's not just an outbreak. An outbreak isn't an outbreak, there's two kinds. There's really, really severe ones, in which the population transitions from low abundance to very, very high abundance over a very short period of time, and then others which are gradual and more sustained. So if we were actually to compare the rate of change in the tree mortality signal between outbreak and non-outbreak populations, you get the idea that the slope of this line is a lot different than these. That is, change over time in terms of tree mortality is occurring really, really rapidly in these outbreak populations. So this allowed us to then use this framework, this population-based framework, to ask the question, well, how is climate driving bark beetle outbreaks in outbreak and non-outbreak populations, and is there a difference? 
So there's four prevalent climate-related hypotheses that you're going to find all throughout the literature. The first being that if there's a large proportion of the landscape that experiences extreme cold, you would expect to see a lower degree of tree mortality because really, really cold winters kill bark beetles. The second hypothesis is, is if there is a significant wind event over a large proportion of the landscape, we may expect to see a higher degree of bark beetle mortality in subsequent years. And the reason for this is that wind throw occurs. If it occurs during the right time of the year, host material stays green, but is unable to mount a significant induced defensive response. So it allows beetles to build up populations really, really rapidly in that wind thrown material. Population growth rate in wind thrown trees can exceed that of standing trees by about 300%. So they're really good hosts when they fall over. Uh, the third hypothesis is basically that years with high precipitation will be associated with a lower degree of spruce beetle mortality because trees that get watered are more vigorous. This is pretty self-evident. Uh, and four, years that have um, warm years are, will be associated with a higher degree of spruce beetle mortality because it allows for more rapid population turnover, more rapid population development. So I was able to basically test all of these hypotheses within the context of that population-based outbreak framework, uh, just using various linear regression approaches. So let's take a look at that. Uh, first, what I can tell you is that nowhere in the continental United States experienced uh, temperature thresholds cold enough to kill spruce beetle in the last 20 years. <laughs> No, not one single place. So everything's fine. Um, <laughs> but in terms of wind events, we did find, in fact, that wind events were associated with an increased uh, likelihood of mortality in years following uh, high wind events, which was as expected. But this differed for outbreak and non-outbreak populations. In fact, this only really occurs in outbreak populations. Non-outbreaking populations, wind events had no effect. Now if we look at growing season temperature, so remember there was the developmental rate hypothesis, we found that growing season temperature unexpectedly was actually associated with abatement of spruce beetle outbreaks. So in outbreaking populations, denoted by the red, there was significantly less tree mortality in warm growing years. Go figure. It's not what we expected. And again, in non-outbreak populations, temperature has no real effect. And then, uh, also interestingly, water year precipitation. So this is water precipitation occurring, I think, between like April and October, I believe. Um, the effect of water year precipitation also differs significantly between outbreak and non-outbreak regions. Now probably as expected in areas that are not undergoing really substantial outbreaks, that is endemic populations, increased precipitation is associated with lower level of tree mortality. It's good, trees got some water, everyone's doing great. In outbreak populations, however, there was no effect of increasing precipitation. So I think my impression is sort of uh, climate be damned, it's population dynamics that are driving beetle behavior in some, in some instances, not solely environmental effects. But then one of the other questions I had was whether or not we could use these relationships to construct a generalizable model that could be used to predict interannual disturbance severity at any national forest in the western U.S. And we were able to put together a pretty good model um, based on these parameters. So using the significant predictors from those hypothesis tests, they were combined into a multivariate model that also accounted for population density in the previous year, not just climate effects, but also included population density. And with about 75% uh, explanatory power, we were able to predict interannual variability in spruce beetle disturbance. So I, with pretty good accuracy, I can tell you, based on a couple of climate metrics and population density the previous year, whether or not you're going to have a spruce beetle outbreak in any, any given year 
more or less. Uh, the other thing I think is cool here is that if we compare the relative importance of each of these variables in their contribution to this model, what we find is that far and away population size was by far the strongest uh, contributor to this model. That is, population pressure in the previous year completely swamps any environmental effects. In fact, you can just take all the rest of these out of here and you get almost the same model. So it's my impression that including information about the population dynamics of the insect and its stage in the population cycle are critical to making predictions about the effects of climate on outbreaks. So what's that all mean? Well, not all climate effects were consistent with what we might expect. In fact, warming is probably associated with the abatement of spruce beetle outbreaks. Uh, and I would also say that this is, we're, we're taking this another mile uh, with Isaac Dell's work, who's found that there's evidence for regional populations that differ really substantially in their thermal biology just within the state. So in southern latitudes within the state of Colorado, beetles have more development time. They emerge and fly more slowly. And in northern latitudes, this process is really sped up quite a bit. And I'll let Isaac talk about that more some other time. But uh, there is evidence for, for pretty substantial differences in the thermal biology of these populations. So I think the lesson here is that in this case, environmental conditions are probably less important than the population phase of the insect um, population. So that's the program in a nutshell. And pretty much everything, a lot of what's been done in the last couple of years, um, a lot of what I told you has either just been published or is in the process of being reviewed or revised right now. We've gotten some very thorough reviews back on some of this. So I'm sure the articles will be very good for all that thoroughness. Um, and that's really all I've got. So let's, uh, let's do questions. I assume these beetles and these spruce trees have been coexisting for a long, long period of time. Is that correct? I believe so. I think, okay. And if the chemistry of the trees is highly heritable, as you suggested, why do you suppose there are so few well-defended trees in the population? Yeah, so I think at the end of the day, it doesn't come down to what your blood type is. It comes down to how much blood you have. So what what that means is there were evidence for two chemical types, yeah. but they didn't really differ that much from one another in terms of their ability to suppress fungal growth. We haven't looked directly at how they impact beetle behavior. Um, but what I can say is that as monoterpene concentration increases, that has a retardant effect on fungal growth much more than changing composition. There was a couple of compounds that seemed to be extremely effective. That's true, yes. You would think that maybe that would be better represented in the tree population. Yeah, that's a good question. And unless there's something else going on that maybe that compound is good against the, the beetle, but has some other effect that's not so nice. Yeah, and I'll be honest, I don't know much about the metabolic pathways that generate these compounds. Um, so it's possible that some of them are very expensive to produce, uh, or it's possible that you know you have sort of the same law of rare alleles, right? And that even very beneficial mutations can be lost or suppressed in a population just due to their infrequency. So I don't know the I don't know the underlying mechanism, but I think that's cool. Yeah. Ben, do you have a question? Yeah, I going off that. Um, did you do a sample across like a wide range in tree age to see whether potentially it was an age-related trend in what you were observing? Were you one of the reviewers by chance? <laughs> 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 no. Uh, so yeah, we we um, I sampled everything. So I have an account. I'm not looking for differences by tree age, for aspect on the tree. 
for uh, phloem thickness. Yeah, I mean, I've gotten drilled on all of that, but I think um, it's important to first establish general variability before trying to target the source of that variability. So in answer to your question, no, I haven't looked across tree ages, though we will be doing that. We have a greenhouse study going uh, with Jane Stewart right now, looking at how pathogenic these fungi are to spruce seedlings. So I'll be sampling fairly soon about 300 spruce seedlings that are like three and four year old seedlings. And that should allow us to pretty well determine whether or not there's a lot of difference between really small trees and really big trees. Dan West had a question. He says, uh, do you think it's critical to take into consideration the temporal scale of infestation with your delta curry carrying analysis? Perhaps the areas of higher delta um, carrying host type simply haven't experienced high pressure. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. So that's one of the things that we need to figure out is is what's remaining in these remnant populations resistant or not. Yeah, so I think that's a very good point. And, and Dan, maybe Dan was one of the reviewers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Mark. So you mentioned, I think, in the earlier slide that this is an ancient uh, symbiosis between the beetles and the fungi. Yes. Do you know how ancient it is? The reason I ask is, if it's related to the first question about you know, most pathogens don't kill their host, you would expect um, that over time, resistant individuals would develop the population. Could this be a new so that's a very complicated question, actually. Um, if one were to look at various phylogenetic data, you would find that the beetle fungus association between tree infesting beetles and specific sets of fungi has arisen many times uh, in evolutionary history. And Dendroctinus as a species is fairly new by comparison to some of these other relationships. So in general, uh, I, don't have a, I don't have like a number off the top of my head, but I mean hundreds of thousands of years old. Uh, I think they've found beetles and amber that still have some of these fungi on them. So you know, some of those studies have shown that it's really, really old. But as far as the phylogeny of the Dendroctinus rufa pinus, leptographia, maybe a tinum interaction, I don't think there's any answer for that, how old that really is. Yeah, start dredging out lake bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> Super great talk, I learned a lot. So that's a good sign. Um, I was wondering, when you sampled the, the trees across the different, where you were sampling across Colorado, in areas, were they all live trees, or did you go to areas where the outbreak was occurring and sample live and dead trees? And I'm asking because maybe those live trees have different genetics than the ones that all died. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we only sampled live trees. So some of those areas that I sampled in were in the midst of pretty significant outbreaks, like up in Monarch Pass. And um, basically anything there that was a uh, suitable size to be killed was. So in Monarch, you know, all our samples are from trees that are, that are poles. Um, whereas in Kucharas Pass in southeastern Colorado, it was like a beautiful spruce stand and everything was this big around. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying we didn't sample dead trees because we can't get reliable monoterpene fractions from them. So as a, at the end there, you're talking about how the beetle population was more important in predicting the mortality or the outbreaks than environmental conditions mm -hmm. of that year. Mm -hmm. But what allowed the populations to get to that level? Was that environmental conditions two, three years prior that might have led up to that? Or? Yeah, that's a good question too. So, so far I've looked uh, at only a couple of time lags. And you know, I'd like to bring those time lags up to like T minus five or T minus 10. But I think the important thing to do will be to look at those areas where you see that big spike in tree mortality and to ask whether the climate in those periods is different than in the subsequent or preceding periods. All right, yeah. uh, one more question. Who wants it? Yeah. Is there any benefit to the beetle from the tree being dead? Um, I mean, is it part of its strategy to kill a tree for what purpose? 
Yes, so this I think has to do with the, the fungal associates actually. So these fungi are really crappy competitors with most species of environmental fungi aside from the pathogen that I showed you. Um, they basically can, their strategy is, hey, we're pretty good at dealing with monoterpenes. So it's thought that really the niche of the fungus is a dying tree. Once the tree is dead, there's too many opportunists for them to hang on and too many other environmental fungi. So um, they basically have like a eight to 12 week, you know, period where they're the dominant because of the high level of tree compounds that are still present before the tree is dead. All right, um, with that, let's thank Seth again.